All right, everybody, let's get started. Um, so it's a pleasure to introduce Marcella Karen, who is our colloquium speaker this week. I found out it was going to be introducing her about five minutes ago, but luckily she is so well known that uh, it doesn't require any preparation. Marcella is an economic physicist who studies physics beyond the standard model, uh, with a special emphasis in uh, Higgs physics supersymmetry. Some of that may be blamed on Carlos, I don't know. Uh, and also electroecariogenesis, which is the subject she's going to be telling us about today, and how to connect it with the LHC. She is also well known as a mentor who's produced many young physicists who are also not good enough anymore at this point in their careers, and one of them. Uh, and uh, she is was until recently the uh, head of the theory group at Fermi Lab. She's now been promoted to director of the theory division, is what I understand. So I think without any further ado, uh, Marcella, please take over. Okay, thank you, Dean. Um, okay. Uh, can you hear me well? Okay, great. Um, so it's a real pleasure to be here today. And um, I will try to tell you a little bit about electrolybergenesis and, and signals at the LHC. And so I will try to start with uh, a bit of setting the tone where we are today. Uh, so the LHC run three um, has started by fifth after uh, three plus years of shutdown. So there is a lot of excitement there. Um, and so then I will tell a bit about uh, what are the big puzzles in, in particle physics. And from some of them, we hope to get some guidance uh, from the LHC. And finally, I, I will tell you a bit about uh, electrolyte biogenesis that is dear to my heart for many years. And then I will hopefully finish, if, as time permits, with three examples of uh, possible explanations of biogenesis related to the uh, Higgs boson. And um, hope this works. A momento. That's working two seconds ago. Um, yes. Yes. Okay. We're in business. Good. Um, okay. So, um, all of you know, of course, about uh, the Higgs mechanism. So there is a, a Higgs invisible Higgs uh, invisible field of energy uh, that uh, permeates all the universe, and uh, uh, turns on at some uh, instance after the Big Bang. Uh, but the point is, the first questions we have is, uh, what turns the Higgs field on? And as, as we discuss, is the Higgs itself through self interactions um, and how it happens. So uh, we know that the, the, Higgs, um, the Higgs field potential, uh, which is uh, a cartoon here, because the, the energetic of uh, the Higgs field turning on to a certain value that is uh, can be a complex value uh, uh, here, okay, and uh, um, so the the the, the scalar field uh, interactions may uh, go to a non may may be a non-zero uh, value, for example, here, uh, but because of the symmetry, uh, they are degenerate backward. And uh, in principle, one would say that that is the moment when you think about the. Uh, um, mechanism of uh, spontaneous symmetry breaking. However, this is not the whole story because in, in reality, what happens is that once uh, the uh, symmetry is broken by the Higgs being in a non-zero vacuum, it caused uh, uh, an, an enormous amount of energy to move uh, fluctuations around the, the throat. And this is because uh, unlike in, in quantum mechanics, we are in quantum field theory. And so there are infinite, infinite degrees of freedom in quantum field theory. But once the degenerate gravity state is chosen, it's very hard to transition to one another. And this is the basic at uh, the concept of a spontaneous symmetry break. Reality, um, as, as I tried to say here from Mr. Higgs, uh, this is uh, applying condensed matter ideas to particle physics, but now, uh, um, instead of being the, the, the media, now the medium is just the quantum vacuum. And in fact, this was a problem that was in the mind of uh, Phil Anderson, as well as uh, Higgs and others at that time, that was to explain that if there was a breakdown, the, the, the Cooper pairs will break uh, quantum electrodynamics inside the superconductor, 
uh, then uh, in principle, one would understand that there should be these massless goldstone bosons and these massless goldstone bosons were not there. And the question was, where are they? People were really puzzled in the 1960s, early 1960s about where were there. So Anderson came with the idea that, okay, what happens really is that um, uh, when, when this uh, breakdown of QED occurs, there is also uh, the, the, the plasmon that is basically the photon inside the superconductor gets a mass, okay? And so the, the longitudinal degree of freedom uh, that is new, the photon comes from these massless goldstone bosons. And reality, this is the same thing that happens in the Higgs mechanism particle physics. Okay? So you note here, I think it's, it's very enlightened that he says this phenomenon, the one that Shasha has described for you, is just the relativistic analog of the plasmon phenomenon to which Anderson has drawn attention. This is the, the reason of the Meissner effect and so on. So this is a, a very strong field of cross fertilization to understand uh, the Higgs mechanism. So uh, now we know that there is a fundamental scalar field with self interactions that causes this spontaneous symmetry breaking. And by doing so, they can explain the mass of the gauge bosons, in the case of the superconductor, the plasmon, the, the, the massive photon. In our case, would be the W and the Z gauge bosons. And of, of also through new interactions, the Yukawa interactions to all matter particles. And, uh, and postulates also, this is very important, uh, the, a remanent uh, particle that is the Higgs boson, okay? So that's what we know about quite well so far. Okay, so uh, the great success of the Higgs boson. Uh, its discovery in uh, uh, 2012, was announced 4th of July, 2012. Um, and the uh, study of all its properties in the past 10 years, the Large Hadron Collider in Geneva, Switzerland, <laughs> provided a first portrait of the electroweak symmetry breaking method. This is a big success that we have. In fact, the existence of these Higgs particles what ensures the calculability of the standard model of particle physics are to very high energies because basically um, um, assures the uh, perturbativity up to uh, very high energies, for example, when we do uh, WW uh, scan. Uh, of course, uh, understanding these properties so well uh, offer new opportunities uh, to explore fundamental questions in particle physics. Among those, biogenesis, dark matter, and even inflation. Today, I will try to concentrate on biogenesis. So the first question we have is what is encoded in the Higgs potential? So I have written here the Higgs potential for you, but in reality, we are putting electroweak symmetry breaking by hand. We are not getting electroweak symmetry breaking in the standard model, you're putting this mass parameter to be negative. Because of that, you get electroweak symmetry breaking. But who decide that this would, was going to happen? Okay. Uh, and the, uh, the next question is, of course, which are the values of these parameters? There are three parameters in the standard model. And then the other thing is that if you look at the value of the top quark, the value of the Higgs mass that we have measured, the value of this, uh, the uh, coupling of the strong interactions, you compute the potential, it happens that there is, uh, you know, a, a, we call it mesta stability. It means that for large energies, the quartic coupling become negative and the potential has a running direction. Okay, this occurs at the standard model with no new physics about 10 to the 12 GE. Okay, so the other issue is, is this a part of a richer scalar sector? Why should be only one of its kind? Uh, and if so, how it can change the dynamics of the electro frequency? The Higgs boson, let me just remind you, uh, a lot uh, we have learned, but a lot understand. Well, first of all, the fact that the Higgs boson is at uh, 125 GV, uh, uh, we, we call it that the mass is at the lucky spot. And it's at the lucky spot because it interacts maximally with many particles of the standard model. If it would have been uh, much lower, for example, we have been uh, uh, much harder to study through its interaction with many of the particles at the Large Hadron Collider. Here we have, uh, you know, the, the coupling of the Higgs to many particles and the particle masses. So this is the W boson and, and uh, the Z boson. And so uh, what we have verified to very high level to the percentage level of accuracy that the Higgs boson, these are measurements from LHC, of course, is related to the Higgs mechanism of electroweak symmetry breaking. The guy we have measured is the guy that is related. Of course, there could be a still uh, time um, room for surprises, and in fact, will be room for surprises for quite a long time. But 
for sure, this guy has a lot to do, the mechanism of a little symmetry breaking, okay? Uh, we have also verified, if you look here, at uh, the bottom Yukawa coupling and the top Yukawa coupling and the tau, this bottom tau and top, that the Higgs boson couples most strongly uh, to the heaviest standard model particles that are the ones of the star generation. And already at the end of last run, there was a three sigma evidence, so we are hoping to see it better, that is talking to the, the particles of the second generation. At LHC, it will be impossible really to find out if it talks to the particles of the first generation, so electron up and down okay, because of the interactions. But they, it's very important because also we don't know if this guy we have discovered is really the guy that is giving mass to all the particles we know. There is no proof of that. Okay, so uh, the other one very important point that we have is that we want to check at LHC is this self-interaction because I told you that this self-interacting uh, quartic coupling is responsible for electroweak symmetry breaking, the self-interactions itself. So uh, we need to measure it and that's quite challenging. However, the first uh, um, information we have is through what we call uh, di Higgs production. For example, uh, here we have the two standard model um, ways of producing a Higgs. This is now a tri, uh, a tri vertex with Higgs. This coupling is proportional to the quartic coupling that I show in the potential. In fact, it's lambda times the vacuum expansion value. So we have measured, and I won't go into the details, but we have measured already to a given precision uh, these uh, uh, variations. So this is the, the star here is the value one of this kappa. Kappa is the ratio what we measure to get with, re to, uh, with respect to the standard model expected value. Okay, so when it's one means that we are measuring exactly the standard model. Of course, there is always some error. The same here. We have measured this at the 7%, 6% level. This kappa equal one would be exactly standard model and we have some deviation with respect to the standard model as we see it here. So we are starting to explore uh, di Higgs production at LHC. What is most exciting with the ingenuity of all the experimentalists is that they're expecting that the final run of LHC, mm -hmm. they, they will be able to measure precisely or to produce di Higgs. But on the contrary, what happens is that there is something new there, as I will try to argue today, if we want to explain electroweak variogenesis. And in that case, we expect to see di Higgs production at LHC earlier. So it's kind of very exciting in the situation where we are today. Okay, as I said, we measure this, we measure it well, we can shed light on Higgs potential and on the electroweak phase transition. And this is uh, what I will try to tell you a bit more about. So, uh, as I told you, uh, we postulate the electroweak symmetry breaking mechanism or the Higgs mechanism, but we would like to know what is behind it. Okay? And so, um, there are two main possibilities that people have been considering. One is radiative breaking. And what it really means is that in electroweak phase transition at which the Higgs turns on, quantum phase transition, okay? So that's an that's example in supersymmetry, okay? Uh, what really happens in supersymmetry for the experts is that the difference between the stop and stop quark mass is what triggers dynamical electroweak symmetry breaking. Another way to say it, uh, we can provide dynamical electroweak symmetry breaking generated by harder order quantum effects cascading on the soft breaking of supersymmetry. Okay, that would be a, an interesting way of having interesting example of having a radiative breaking. And uh, Tim said about supersymmetry. This talk is not about supersymmetry, but let me just say a few words here. That the LHC experiments are probing the SUSY particle spectrum. Uh, the color SUSY particles, the companions of the quarks and the gluons, are the ones with the highest cross section, and so we have tested them at the order of a few. EV already, but let me remind you uh, that when we think about the partners of the top quark, uh, the, the, given the Higgs mass value of 125 GV, we think of even at the simplest models, uh, this would imply that the stops should be at the TV range, which is the values that we are starting to probe now. In fact, high Lumi LHC and all the possibilities are going to be probing things that are at most in one and two TV. Okay, so we are starting to probe. So there's a lot of room for supersymmetry at LHC, contrary, contrary to what may be uh, uh, thought of uh, sometimes. The other issue is compositeness. Okay, if we think about 
uh, condensed matter. Bosonic states are always suggestive of compositeness. So in condensed matter, we encounter composite states, as for example, the, the Cooper pairs that uh, trigger phase transitions and symmetry breaking. Okay. Why not if the Higgs made some, some composite state? Uh, there are many new physics models that allow Higgs to be a composite state. And the idea is that uh, the Higgs is um, like the, uh, the, the Goldstone mode that comes from the uh, spontaneous breaking of a global uh, symmetry in the composite sector, an enlarged symmetry. Okay? And this is uh, in some way uh, related to um, a strong, a strong interacting theory. So you can think about uh, QCD. Okay? Where now uh, the the scale of compositeness or the scale at, at which uh, this uh, spontaneous breaking occurs, instead of being lambda QCD, is uh, something of the order of two or several TV. Okay, so the Higgs, uh, the same as the pion, ends up being a pseudo Goldston boson. So it has zero mass, but then acquires mass much smaller than the rest of the composite scale because of its interactions with the uh, uh, standard model particles at the loop level. Okay, so it's a pseudo Goldstone boson. And so then there are the other, the other, the same, they are called raw, um, to, to make an, a relation with QCD. There are other uh, many uh, resonances in our um, high, uh, super symmet high highly symmetric theory that we are spontaneously broken uh, that are of the order of the TV or more. And again, LHC will probe these resonances up to the order of five to 10 uh, uh, TeV range with the possibility of discovering this resonance that will be extra gauge bosons or vector-like fermions, for example. Okay. So these these two areas will help us understand what is behind electroweak symmetry breaking: some additive breaking, some quantum phase transition, or some compositeness that we need to understand better about. It. Okay. Any questions there? Before I uh, can I go back one point? Yes, please. Um, oh, sorry. This is just the, the, the inverse of the confinement scale. So this is a, a scale that is, let's say, so there is theory is defined by a coupling here. So I didn't say strong strong uh, gauge coupling, uh, or usually smaller than four pi for the theory to make. Uh, and the composite scale uh, that is like, be the lambda QCD, but here it's called M star. So one over M star is uh, related to this, the size, if you want, to the geometric size of the Higgs. If we are measuring one, one over M, let's call it LH, okay? Uh, if LH is zero, so M is infinity, then the Higgs would be, uh, um, would be elementary. If, if, if LH is different from zero, it would be some compositeness of the Higgs, okay? Thank you for the question. So uh, this is my good friend, Fabiola. Um, we used to be good friends when we were all young uh, and we keep in. So LHC just started. These are, um, and it started running. And then these are the first uh, collisions. If you read very carefully, this is July 5th, both okay. Atlas, sorry. What? You cannot read July 5th? Okay. It says. 2022 July 5th. So this is uh, CMS and this is Atlas and these are you know collisions with high PT. They are not identifying what they are, but they are real collisions with all the detectors up, everything up, everything going on. So run three is back. Um, Didn't they stop though? Okay? I thought it stopped. Uh, minor. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm not. I'm not losing my sleep on that. I mean, there, yes, please. Can you repeat the questions for the people? On oh, no, I don't want to repeat that question. <laughs> <laughs> there is no, well, there is, a, they are breathing to be sure that everything is okay. I mean, you know, as you know, one has to be very careful. This is, uh, um, you know, magnets pushing the energy. The energy is now at these collisions where 13.6 TV. Uh, one could say this is a small variation. But if you are really looking for very energetic objects, that are, I don't want to talk about that today. There are some very interesting ATV things that they are looking at. And so if you are at the edge of what you can produce, then uh, bumping up the energy from only a little makes a huge difference. 
because you know the cross sections doesn't go linearly. Okay, so uh, so new record higher energy at this uh, at this uh, center of mass energy before with 13 TV uh, is 50 percent increased collision rate. Don't, don't ask me the details about that, but it's very impressive to me. They have many more collisions, so they are be, being very careful that you know, the, the detectors, as I will say, so a lot of new. Uh, stuff that has been um, implemented, and so they are trying not to make a, you know a big blast, of course, and so they are being very careful. Atlas and CMS plan to collect, if this tells you nothing, to 17 versus Fentobar new data each of the detectors, but this is about twice what they have collected now, and this is in the next three years, run three. Okay, and they they plan to collect a factor of 10 more data by the end. They High lumi, that is the end of the LHC phase. Okay, so a lot of possibilities there. Yeah, this is, I, I will ask you about this exactly after the seminar. No. Uh, so this is where we are, run three. We are going, so the green is running and the rest you don't need to know. Uh, so the light green is running. This is run three. There will be a lot shut down and then two runs. The idea is that by 2038, it will be the end of the LHC. Of the LHC phase. Of course, if there is something exciting there, this plan will change. And maybe it will be an upgrade in energy with new magnets. Who knows? But the plan is now is uh, for the next uh, almost 20 years. And again, so uh, just a word. These are beautiful detectors. So I thought I would put the pictures because they're amazing. Uh, CMS and, and uh, Atlas and CMS. So Atlas and CMS have upgraded in many detectors of systems. They have uh, uh, the ability to trigger on um, much wider range of, of, of uh, event types. Um, and, uh, and they park data, which is impressive, that instead of throwing a lot of the data, they have the ability to park it, then go and look at it, which is a new, uh, new feature. Um, important, I think, they have the ability to trigger on new kind of events. And this is important because uh, you know, you heard, I think, last uh, uh, Wednesday, the, the colloquium about, uh, you know, super light particles and their sectors. Um, the point is that um, there are a lot of uh, new ideas, maybe pushed by theories, and among those, the idea that you can have either feeble interacting particles or, or, or long lived particles that would be interesting for as, as a part of a dark sector where dark matter resides. So they are using uh, uh, detectors, uh, for example, n muon calorimeters in many new ways, look at these particles that they were not doing before. And also better reconstruction of many important objects, objects and able to understand better tau leptons and charms. Okay, so that's the end of my LHC uh, um, update uh, so far. Uh, so, but what I would say is that the LHC discovery program, because of what I got I was telling you because people are are using you know um, AI uh, very innovative ways of using detectors, improving the way that they handle data, and all that. Uh, all this implies that the discovery reach of the LHC experiments grows faster than a straightforward extrapolation of current sensitivity. And, and this is I was one of these meetings, the LHCP meeting, uh, and uh, a few months ago, I think, and. Uh, I was amazed by the ingenuity of this uh, many thousand group of young scientists trying to push the edge of knowledge. So, of course, uh, there are many discoveries uh, in this mature program. Uh, ones that are dear to my heart, of course, are cousins uh, of the Higgs uh, with many types and many possible implications. Of course, we are searching for their matter. As I said, their sector, fever interrupted particles, long lived particles. They are searching for new forces, uh, new kinds of fermions. Um, as I said, the Higgs self-coupling can be anomalously large, and then we may have surprises sooner rather than later. Um, we are trying to understand if the Higgs boson is composite. We may not find that final decision, final answer at high Lumi LHC, and we will learn a lot about it. Uh, and then, of course, we are exploring CP violation in the Higgs sector, flavor violation, and certainly supersymmetry and much more. So, um, just to pause for a second. Uh, so, where we were, uh, so this was a theorist particle, particle theorist view of the road ahead uh, when LHC started. Um, so, we were here and we were thinking that you know, maybe some, many of our ideas, supersymmetry, 
strong dynamics, maybe implying extra dimensions, maybe with or without the Higgs, maybe understanding their matter, and we will learn from the Higgs, uh, from the LHC about that. And this was connected with more you know, uh, profound ideas like um, string theory or, or unified uh, or, or unification of, of forces. Today, today uh, this is the consensus particle theory's view of the road ahead. Uh, so we have learned a lot. We have learned there is a Higgs, so you know, composite uh, uh, strong dynamic models without a Higgs are not uh, in fashion anymore. They have been uh, taken away. Um, there is, of course, not an LHC, but there's a lot of dark matter searches, as you heard um, also in, in many other talks. Um, the direct detection, the, the usual direct, the usual, so to say, the, the long um, um, system direct detection experiments uh, are pushing the edge and they're very close to the neutrino floor, not yet there. And there are many new paths to think for lidar matter and ways to detect it. Last, last colloquium was about that. Um, so I think what we, we, we are thinking now is that um, there, are, there are some uh, lookouts and we can get some information. These are all the many paths that we are now exploring. And, uh, and I think that we hope the LHC data uh, will help us to look the rest by direction. Okay, so uh, before going to abiogenesis, let me just say that uh, a lot of particle physics is missing in the standard model. Uh, the standard model tries to, pay, to explain 5% of all what we know, but even in this 5% that is here, there are a lot of questions that we don't have answers for. Okay? As I said, we don't know why electrowisymmetry breaking occurs. Uh, we don't know the history of the electrowave first transition. Uh, we don't know how are these so many different uh, mice hierarchies and flavor structure. There's a lot we need to know about the 5% we think we have a model for. Uh, there are also uh, a lot of other unknowns uh, that are part of what particle physics should answer, the nature of their matter, the origin of matter and matter, matter and antimatter symmetry, the generation of neutrino masses, and this could belong to a total new sector, new loss, and, uh, and, and new opportunity. Then, of course, there are profound uh, questions like you know, what caused the uh, universe's accelerated expansion, what are the quantum properties of gravity, uh, what caused cosmic inflation after the Big Bang. These are very crucial uh, questions that we hope also um, to get little pieces of the puzzle to, to answer. So the standard model is silent about all these things I'm showing you here, okay? And our hope is that LHC data will come like lose some little piece of them. And, uh, sorry. Okay. So today, now, uh, I will focus on the possibility of electroweak biogenesis, which may tie together uh, some or maybe many of the questions highlighted here. Let's move without further ado to the mystery of our asymmetric universe. Okay. Um, so antimatter is governed by the same interactions as matter, we think. Uh, the observable universe, here we are, is made mostly of matter. Uh, and antimatter is only seen in the cosmic rays or produced in the lab. Uh, rates observed in cosmic rays are consistent with secondary emission. So what we know, and precision cosmology gives a lot of information on the uh, baryon abundance. Uh, if we look at this, that I, I will not go into very detail, but if we look at, you know, abundance of primordial elements, helium-4, deuterium, helium-3, and lithium, and we look at a prediction from the back nucleosynthesis, these are here, and we put that with all the information we get from, from uh, temperature fluctuations from CMB, uh, we get uh, a good information that uh, the ratio of baryon uh, number density to, to photon density is something of the order of 10 to the minus 10. The question is what generated this small observed baryon anti baryon asymmetry? Uh, was it an initial condition or does it happen some way in the evolution of the universe? Uh, so, of course, I, I, will, I will pledge for the second case here. Uh, so let me just back up for a second and tell you a bit about um, what we already think we have. Uh, and so let's think about baryon number violation in the standard model. So in the standard model, if we think at the classical level, uh, baryon number is conserved. But if we think at the quantum level, baryon number is violated. And why that happens, you may remember, 
you are teaching quantum field theory three, you have all the calculations clear in your mind. If you don't, probably uh, it's harder to follow. But reality, what happens is for gauge theories, okay, what finds is that by the violation of classically preserved symmetries appear due to the quantization process, and this is the adro bardeen shakib anomaly. Okay. And the problem happens when the, the, the gauge theories that you are considering are themselves chiral. So you have a gamma five there. When that happens, as it happens for the chiral weak interactions, uh, you need to preserve your, your gauge theory, even if it is chiral. But that, when you do the, the, the calculation, means that the preservation of this gauge symmetry for the chiral weak interactions directly yields a non conservation of baryon and lepton numbers. However, it, it does it in a way that the current for baryon and lepton number, these indices as well as U2 for the, for, the for the weak gauge interactions, are the same and are proportional to this effect. So if uh, this instant on uh, action, which is the tunneling between, we, we think about like the semi-classical configuration like in space and time, uh, tunnels between uh, a vacuum of quant uh, different quantum numbers. So if this is equal to zero, okay, and you put this, this uh, result here, you get, uh, using Gauss law, you get that there would be some um, variation of, of lepton and baryon number or baryon and, and, and baryon charge. And so, as I said here, the anomalous process violate both lepton and, num and baryon numbers. So they both violate B plus S. But if you look here, it preserve B minus L. Okay? This, this is a cartoon in, in, in field space of uh, uh, the transition of different numbers, could be baryon numbers or lepton numbers. And so, of course, they can proceed, proceed from quantum tunneling to these uh, instanton configurations. But there is also the production of what we call the sphaleron. The sphaleron is like uh, the middle point, a static configuration of the instanton. Okay. And so this, this uh, and the, the energy of, of the sphaleron is like the height of this barrier. So you need to have enough energy to go over the barrier with the sphaleron. So uh, this, this energy is what separates vacuum different uh, uh, baryon and lepton number. So this violation of baryon and lepton number, although we preserve it minus L, can proceed the production of a sphaleron. We need to have enough like that. Okay, so sacker of conditions. Um, any questions so far? So uh, starting from CPT conserving theory, sacker of observe that there are necessary conditions for, for uh, generating baryogenesis in any form that you want to generate it. The first one, of course, is generation of baryon number, where that is kind of clear. If the universe is star symmetric, you need to violate baryon number to generate any baryon number. Um, mid C and CP violation, this is basically because C and CP violation treat differently baryons and antibaryons. So to, to kind of uh, remove antimatter, you need to have both C and CP. If you have only C or only CP, you will not be able to, uh, to do it. And then you need uh, out of equilibrium conditions, and I will go back to that. And this is basically to, re to suppress the reverse process. You generate it, you don't want to wash it back. Okay? All three requirements, incredibly wise, are fulfilling the standard model. Okay? Uh, so this, these conditions are fulfilling the standard model, but uh, these are necessary but not sufficient conditions to produce the observer symmetry. And I will go into that in the next slides. Uh, of course, there are possible alternatives. And if you ask me, I will talk about them. But you, due to time, I think I will not go into that. Today, uh, I will consider about electroweak baryogenesis when we think that the baryon uh, asymmetry generated was generated at electroweak phase transition, therefore electroweak baryogenesis in the early universe, when the Higgs field developed non-zero vacuum body. At the time that the Higgs turned on, this generation, the baryon asymmetry occur. Okay, that's the idea. Um, so, of course, as I said, the, the big question is, can electroweak baryogenesis take place, or the first big question is, can electroweak baryogenesis take place in the standard model? This was answered before I start, start studying physics, but I will walk you through uh, there, almost. 
Um, so we are going to go through the processes of generation of the baryon asymmetry. To, so there are different steps. So you need to generate the baryon asymmetry. You need then to conserve it until today, because we are generating the baryon asymmetry at the electroweak scale. Then we have to ask what happens between the electroweak scale and today. Do we keep it? And then we are going to discuss is this very very briefly is this possible within the particle content and the specific properties of the standard model. We will see that it's not. So let me just remind you that if we think about baryon number violation uh, through Svalion processes, or so if we are at zero temperature, uh, this is the, the instant on uh, um, action, they are very strongly suppressed. So this number is like 10, 10 to the minus 120. So those doesn't happen today. But if we are, we switch on temperature, and if temperature is very high, basically, have enough energy to go over the barrier and, and go from one baryon uh, back in with baryon number to another. When you start lowering the temperature, then you need to have enough energy, so to say, in order to go over the barrier. So this is a final temperature, this baryon number violating process, this is some constant, is Boltzmann suppressed. And this Boltzmann suppression depends on the uh, energy of the sphaleron for the temperature, exponentially here. And the energy of the sphaleron can be computed because it depends on the H bosons and the Higgs field is proportional to the vacuum expectation value of the Higgs field at the given temperature where the, the, the weak uh, gauge coupling. This VT is the Higgs band. We are going to be concentrated on this. So uh, to generate baryon number uh, of the electroweak phase transition, uh, what the idea is, unlike, unlike uh, um, generating leptogenesis or generating the matter antimatter asymmetry at the GAT scale, here we are assuming that nothing has been generated until the scale of the phase transition. Okay? So here we have, oh, sorry. So B is equal L is equal zero at T equal, at any T above the critical temperature. Uh, so then uh, what we need, so the, the, the first sort of phase transition uh, um, occurs through a bubble nucleation. And in the first sort of phase transition, what happens is that uh, your theory is kind of, of up uh, in the false vacuum, and the false vacuum is here where the Higgs is off. And suddenly you start uh, generating bubbles uh, of the true vacuum, okay, when the Higgs is on, and these bubbles start expanding. And so uh, the idea is to define some critical temperature, and the critical temperature is when the vacuum spec, the VEV of the Higgs at this uh, B critical or B at T critical is equal to the potential of the Higgs, the false back. This is our definition of critical temperature. And this is very nice to study the structure of the potential. However, as, uh, as I will tell you before, there is some extra ingredient there. So the idea is the bubbles, which uh, expand near the speed of light, uh, um, they, are, they, are, they, are, they are expanding until, I, as I said, until the whole, uh, the bubbles uh, expand until the, the whole universe is um, um, in the true vacuum of the Higgs on. And it's kind of, if you think very stupidly, it's like, you know, you have boiling water, you have the bubbles, the bubbles of gas expand, 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 and escape. Okay. So, uh, and the point is that the process near the wall are highly out of equilibrium. <laughs> so this is uh, a bit dense, but bear with me because this is the core generating the baryon asymmetry, the electroweak phase transition. There are two ingredients that we need. Okay. The first ingredient, again, as I told you, I am not eating here. I'm starting with B equal L equal zero. Okay, I'm not putting anything by hand. I told you that there is CP violation. And in fact, this CP violation is, uh, um, uh, is kind of um, uh, started by, uh, the back, by, the, by the bubble wall, by the Higgs. Here, the Higgs is, is uh, um, on. And, and here the Higgs is off outside the bubble. 
the particles that flow into this expanding wall, bubble wall, because they are uh, CP violating forces, uh, and these CP violating forces are different between particles and antiparticles, what they do, they create uh, uh, what we say a chiral asymmetry, meaning that uh, although left and right handed particles are, are, are interacting differently, and particles and antiparticles and, and interacting differently. If you look at this equation here, I generate a chiral asymmetry, a difference between in the left handed, but I generate a, uh, the same type of chiral asymmetry with opposite sign in the right hand. So if you look at this, baryon number here is equal to zero. I have not violated baryon number, just only generate what we call a CP asymmetry. Then the sphalerons come, and the sphalerons, as I told you, they violate B plus L, but preserve B minus L. So what they do, uh, if we are here, and I'm sorry, you should have done it the other way, to, this is a slower, but the, the sphaleron basically preserves B minus L. If you have baryons here, uh, all what it can do is turn it into anti-leptons. If you have anti-quarks here, all what the sphaleron can do is make it leptons. Okay. But because I have this chiral asymmetry, uh, the, uh, the, there are more quarks than antiquarks. Imagine this this way, uh, right? So, so there are more antiquarks than quarks. So, the, this process is slower than this one. Okay. So, naturally, you are generating uh, uh, a difference uh, between these two processes. And the key here is that the sphalerons only talk left-handed particles. Okay. They are, they would they they do that. They 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 change. Uh, baryons into uh, antileptons and, and antibaryons into leptons, they only touch this part because they don't see this part. And because of that, if you, if you write very profoundly, very, very simply, the number of baryons minus the number of antibaryons, of course, would be this plus this. The, the point is that the sphalerons can deflate it and piece F and fraction F, this. Uh, asymmetry only in the left handed cell. And as a result, you have a net asymmetry generated this way. As I said, nothing happens in the right handed sector. Of course, you generate a variosymmetry, asymmetry, generate an anti lepton asymmetry because B minus L has to be, uh, has to be, um, um, sorry. Okay. Then the baryons here do the job. Okay. However, I said here, this is slower than this, and therefore you generate this asymmetry. If I would allow the sphalerons to be active infinite time, at the end, they will tend to wash out everything. So the other next step of, of electroweak biogenesis is that after the variants have done their job close to the bubble wall, you need to shut them off so that they are not erasing what they create. Okay. So, oh, my God. Yeah, uh, here. So then the second condition. So the first condition there I show you is how you generate the baryon asymmetry at the electroweak scale. Of course, you have to do your calculation and see that you generate the same the right amount. This is an issue that I will come back uh, in the standard model that has to do with the amount of CP violation. Okay. That, that uh, plays a, a role in, in these forces. But now, as I told you, uh, once you generate the variance symmetry, well, we are here today. We have to be, we are here today. We have to be sure this asymmetry stays, the one that we observe today. So, for as I said, for a short period, uh, the, the electroweak sphalerons work to generate the sodium variance symmetry, and we need to shut them off quickly to prevent washout of the symmetry. Again, what happens is that uh, if the variance number was zero, some t larger than t critical, independent of whatever is the source. Then we generate some baryon number at t critical. Okay? And then we have to compute, and, and this you, you just can do the evolution of the um, number density considering the expansion of the universe with the Hubble constant and the, uh, the rate of uh, baryon number annihilation due to sphalerons, creation and annihilation due to sphalerons, the sphaleron rate. Okay? Solve the equation, and you get this here. And you see this has a Hubble exponential. And of course, this thing would be big. This would wash out anything I have generated. And today, this would be zero. So that's not possible, right? I need 
have a condition here so that what is here much lower than one. And uh, one can see that this is equivalent to say that the, uh, the, the baryon number, um, the rate of baryon number violation is to be lower than the Hubble. And when that happens, baryon process, baryon violating processes are frozen. And if you work out this condition, what give you this condition, and this condition because the sphaleron energy is proportional to be critical, uh, via T critical implies that VT critical over T critical has to be of order one. And this is why we say that we need a strong first order phase transition for biogenesis. The strong first order phase transition is just not to wash out whatever you were able to generate at the electron wave phase transition. Okay? This is, if this is much lower than one, then you do the calculation here, this will be zero. Not good. Okay? So, Preserve the strong the baryon asymmetry demands a strong first order phase transition. Uh, because of time, I will not go through this very much. But in reality, uh, the, the, we we study T critical because it's looking at the vacuum structure. In reality, we should look at the nucleation temperature, and the nucleation temperature is more complicated because you need to compute. Uh, basically, uh, you need to compute the the path uh, in, in in field space that minimizes the Euclidean action. And uh, this becomes quite difficult. The case of the Higgs uh, in the standard model is one direction, one field. You could have many, uh, many fields as we will discuss, and then it becomes quite difficult to compute the nucleation. But we, we do compute the nucleation temperature, just not go that now. Um, so uh, I already explained to you uh, that uh, the standard model has all these conditions, has the sphalerons, has CP violation, has the, a, a strong for, and has an electroweak phase transition. However, um, unfortunately, uh, the standard model fails for two reasons. The first one is that, yes, it has an electroweak phase transition, uh, but the electroweak phase transition is, is not a strongly first order. It's actually not even first order, okay? So, so and, and this is a computation done many years ago. Well, I don't know really, people did it, but probably this is a nicer picture. And when we discovered that is when we measure the Higgs mass. If the Higgs mass would have been below 75 GB, we would have been in business, at least from this part of the story. Okay? The Higgs mass is here, and therefore uh, the, the phase transition is moved first order. So already, if we would have generated, we would have erased it. Okay. But we cannot generate it, and this is quite complex, but the idea is that CP violation in the standard model, as you know, appears in the CKM uh, matrix. And because the forces that uh, make a difference uh, of, the, of uh, interacting with matter and antimatter for the Higgs field, Higgs mainly interacts with the top, so I'm thinking about the top, it basically force depends on the variation of the argument of, of the mass of these particles. And what happens is, this is quite technical yeah. for the experts maybe, what happens is that you can only generate a, a, um, an imaginary piece uh, of the top core mass at very high loop order. And that means that CP violation, um, as it is in the standard models through the CKM mass matrix, uh, is not enough to generate the right number of baryon asymmetry. Okay, so. Basic questions we have. Uh, we want to go beyond the standard model. What we have to ask is, was we go beyond the standard model? What was the mechanism that triggered electron symmetry equation? Okay. So we know that the standard model has a parameter solution. Uh, does this mechanism involve an expanded Higgs sector? In most cases, the answer is yes. Uh, was the resulting transition a strongly first order? Uh, where the, what was the real pattern of the phase transitions? You can have a multi phase transition. Was there an electro -E phase transition to start, start with at all? So we, we can answer these questions. Then we can get informed about whether electro -E biogenesis is a viable explanation to observe baryon FS in our unit. Okay. Do that. People have been working a lot. Um, I mean, in, for, for decades, but uh, with a strong day, uh, why I'm excited today is because most cases of biogenesis, of electroweak biogenesis, you have new scalar fields. And these scalar fields, most cases, can be 
look for an LHC. That's what this question somehow um, acquires new relevance today. Of course, in most cases, you also have some new particles that you may also look at LHC. In some other cases, you also uh, have models that have dark matter um, and all these things come together. But, but in my mind, the most exciting is that the simplest case of electroweed biogenesis demands additional scalars that we can look at LHC, look for LHC, okay? So these are the models. I'm not going to go through them. There are many, as you see, and they are exquisite, some of them more exquisite than others. So let me just tell a bit about the single extensions. So this is the absolutely simplest thing you can think of. And so, of course, I'm not saying that this is the model of nature. We're just trying to learn, We're looking at, this, at these models, what are the things that we need? What are the things that are going to make it possible uh, to explain biogenesis at the electrolyte scale? Okay? So that's why there are all these possibilities. We don't know which would be real model. So let me just pause for a second here and say, uh, in order to compute the, the electroweed phase transition, we need to understand the Higgs potential. And the Higgs potential has some different pieces. So here I'm doing what is called one loop effective field potential. You can go higher orders and we, we have gone higher orders, but for the sake of, of telling you the story, I'm stopping here. Okay? At the minimal level, I can stop. Okay, at the minimal level is this one. So we have the zero temperature potential that I already wrote for you in the standard model, but now beyond the standard model would be different. Uh, you have what is called the one loop column and bumper potential. I'm happy to go more into this, but let me just say that this yields for normalization uh, scale independence. You need to put it, the one loop. And then you have the important part that is thermal contributions. You need to consider the thermal contributions because you're considering your things at some critical time. Um, the, the, if you can see there, there's, these expressions are horrible in reality, <laughs> but, but if you look at uh, the simplest case, you have, uh, this is the simplest case, you have some temperature dependent T square uh, and some temperature dependent, linear temperature dependent. And these are masses, as you see, in the field, the background of the Higgs field. What this means is this, uh, these masses are, they have other pieces, but for sure have a piece that Mass is proportional, mass square is proportional to the Higgs field square itself. Okay, these are these. In the standard model, if you do all this song and dance, you get something of this type. And you should observe here that if we are at, this is my, my zero temperature analysis. And so if I put sufficiently high temperature, this thing would become positive, and this would be, implies symmetry restoration, the standard model. And this piece here, this temperature piece with an H cube term, what basically gives me a barrier, finite temperature, so that can really have first order phase transition. Okay. However, what matters, as I will tell you, is what is this piece? How big is this coefficient? Okay. Um, so, in, so you can do this calculation um, perturbatively, and if you do the things properly, let me just it for the moment. Remember that I said that I defined this critical temperature here. So this height here is related to this value, the uh, standard model, and it's related to the sum of all the cube of all light boson particles couplings, which in the standard model are just the, the, the modes, the transversal modes of the uh, gauge the W and the Z. Okay. This is what is here. This is a quantity we can compute very clearly in the standard model. Well, the and, and it happens that Vt over Tc is proportional to E over this lambda T. Okay. And just a back of the envelope calculation, because the, the Higgs mass, if you do the calculation, proportional to lambda V square, and we know what is the Higgs mass. We know what is this coefficient, because we know all the particles that can be there, gauge bosons. It happens that in order to have these larger than one, we'll have, this is perturbative. Uh, the Higgs mass lower than 40. The actual value I show you with lattice calculations is lower than 70. But the, the back of the envelope calculation is the same. Okay, The Higgs is too light, uh, too heavy, sorry. <laughs> Higgs is too heavy to allow for electro uh, for a strong force of the phase transition in the standard. But having said that, if you want to do calculation in any other model, you need to go 
compute whatever is your potential here. This is what we do. So want to go beyond the standard model, now this potential not going to be only dependent on the Higgs phi, but would be much more complex. Okay? So you will have different scalars that will contribute of many types. In, in supersymmetry, the stops are a big contribution or other scalar, other Higgs cousins. And so I am not going to go into detail here, but basically um, you can have effects at tree level that could help you with a strong first order first transition. Uh, and you can have effects at loop level uh, that help you. You can have finite temperature effects. And in some ways, uh, this is a bit uh, a schematic because of course, uh, once you are uh, with multiple field space, this is not so simple, it becomes more complicated. But um, so we can do that. And uh, but what happens here is that, um, so new fields couple directly to the Higgs, they modify the potential. They can be either, um, I will show you one example of this. We can make, make this lambda uh, become smaller. So V over, V over T becomes larger because it's proportional to one over lambda, lambda effective. Um, you could also have like supersymmetry in the MS, NMSSM, you can have some um, different effects that give you a barrier, zero temperature. Or uh, you can just have uh, thermal effects. Um, for example, in, in supersymmetry, in the minimal supersymmetry tensor standard model, for many time, for many years, we thought with Carlos when we were young at CERN uh, that we have discovered a great way to look for for uh, electroweak biogenesis, and that was related to the effects of stops. And in fact, that model survived until so long ago, a few years ago, I don't, not so no, so quite 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 recently. Uh, and it's only because of the precise measurements of the Higgs uh, couplings that I told you, uh, not because we have not found the stop, so we could go around that, but because of the precise measurements that in reality, uh, this type of uh, electroebarogenesis in the minimal supersymmetry standard model would be against uh, what we measure from gluon fusion for the Higgs. Okay, so that, that's really the killer. Uh, so it's, it's very exciting and it's all very, um, very interconnected. We are trying to solve a problem that has many, many, many pieces. And um, I come back to the LHC because this is you know, our reality check. So I don't know how, I, I have now three examples, but probably I only have time for three minutes. Three minutes. One, one example per minute. Any questions before I go to the example? Uh, so maybe I just go on only with the simplest example. Um, so as I told you, uh, the, well, the simplest example to will be to have, this is the, the standard model potential. Now we are asking, adding a singlet that uh, has a similar potential, but also there is a mixing term. You can put other things here. Um, you only look at that, you are thinking that this is C2 symmetric. What I'm, there are many options, but, uh, what is interesting that I, I work here with, with Jen and Ikun actually, um, is the case where um, you break uh, the C2 symmetry spontaneously. This is particularly interesting because uh, this singlet that we are putting here can be the, the Higgs-like boson of a complex scalar uh, in a dark sector that, that, uh, and, and, and basically spontaneously break uh, dark Higgs symmetry. You are thinking about um, dark matter would be interesting um, to, to have this, ex, this case of a spontaneous recent. Um, so we did all the calculation of this potential. You don't want to look at it. The temperature piece is here. Here are the pieces that will restore symmetry. Temperature will be quite high. We do this analysis and we actually find very, inter find very interesting solutions the first or the first transition. And most interestingly, uh, we find that uh, exotic Higgs decays at LHC are a potent probe to this electroweak biogenesis model. So that, that's what is interesting to us. So uh, as I told you before, and now this B over TC is like an order parameter, like a guidance when you have more than one direction. 
as, but what you see here is this lambda tilde effective and the lambda tilde effective is uh, what it was in the standard model the second standard model but what it was for the, for the, the standard model Higgs minus this mixing over for this lambda s that I this is the type of lambda s and lambda m so you see that the mixing sufficiently large will make this sufficiently small and then I will have a strong force of the phase transition and this is what you see here sufficiently small lambda tilde C over TC becomes uh, larger than one you have the right uh, strong force of the phase transition okay. so of course why this is interesting why I say this is because this same mixing parameter here is related to this what is otherwise called here sine theta which is the mixing between the mass eigenstates between the singlet and the, and the Higgs. And we know from, from LHC uh, um, pre precision measurements that this angle has to be lower than 0.4. We will scrutinize more in high lumen LHC. We already have a strong constant. So there is a, uh, a tension from one side. You want this to be as, as high as, as large as possible. Okay? Um, from other side, you have a bound precision measure. Okay. Uh, so, so what this means is that uh, the branching ratio of the Higgs into the singlets cannot be too light because we need this guy to be sufficiently strong in order to have spheres of the phase transition. And that's kind of a no loose theorem that if you look for Higgs exotic decays in this model, either you find them, or you are going to show that this mechanism doesn't work. Okay. So to wrap up, I guess, I will only mention, oh, this is gravitational, it's beautiful. Um, yes, okay. Okay, you can ask. Uh, so, of course, the, there can be more extended Higgs sectors. I am not going to go into that uh, today, but it's very nice work we have done with Nashin and, and, and Carlos and Ikun here uh, on trying to think about extended sectors. And the only thing I would say, so this is an example of symmetry, where you have two Higgs doublets, that are charged on the electronic symmetry and a singlet. This is the next to minimal symmetry standard model. And the long song at dance is that uh, what we learned from this is because this is uh, creating a, a, a barrier at, uh, at uh, zero, zero temperature already, is that um, um, there is a quite, I'm oh, sorry, I won't go there, don't go there. Uh, so there is, um, so we look at the vacuum structure, we see that these are perfectly viable solutions for, for uh, strong electroweave phase transition. This is the heavy Higgs in the order of 500, you know, 1,000 uh, GV. I remind you there's a nice uh, little hint of a 1.1 Higgs, um, Higgs at uh, LHC. Uh, and this is uh, the lightest uh, like uh, Higgs that is in this region of parameter space. And what we observe, the main I want to tell you is that you cannot just get happy with the vacuum structure, you need to do hard work computing time and improbability because things can change quite drastically. So the results that have been, you go in the literature, of course, usually we do this analysis because it's much, uh, it's less time consuming, less, uh, you know, much less costly um, from the point of view of computation. Uh, this uh, model has a lot of beautiful um, collider under matter opportunities, but it's also uh, quite quite tight because in a spider that I have very light particles here, uh, it, it actually should be looking for um, kind of a sort the case of the Higgs into other Higgses in order to find them because it's not as quite. Finally, I won't go into this, but I want to tell advertise this that is dear to my heart, super dear to my heart. Uh, one of the problems we have. I, I, in the past two examples, I told you how to make a strong force of the phase transition. But I, of course, I also need to have strong CP violation or sources of CP violation to have the whole package as I try to do. Um, the problem is that we have very good electrodipole moment experiments that constrain the amount of CP violation that you can have. There is a tension between the amount of CP violation you need in order to generate the baryon asymmetry and the bounds from electric dipole moment. Okay. So, and the, this tension is quite strong. So, a good idea, I think it's a good idea, 
So a good idea to do that is to think that CP violation occurs in a dark sector. Then you have, so there you are not, uh, it's not that you totally evade the bounds of uh, electric dipole moments, but they come to you at higher order loops because you have to communicate the dark sector in the okay. lower sector. Okay. This is a lot to say, so I'm just only going to say this in words. Um, but this this model that that I, I I really like, and we are working more on on this with, with uh, um, Equin and and other colleagues here. Um, so this is basically a new mechanism for electroviberogenesis, where you have a dark sector. Dark sector is quite interesting. Dark matter has CP violation. Okay. Then you have the standard model third sector where the sphalerons leave. These sphalerons are still the ones that are going to change the, 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 the CP violate the chiral asymmetry that we get into the baryon asymmetry. So that part will be the same. But the point is that by having CP violation in this dark sector, we can evade uh, EDM uh, because it arises at higher loops. This, this model, and I will finish here, has an interesting, um, interesting, very interesting phenomenology. And basically, it has a Higgs portal. And the Higgs portal does two things, the source of the CP violation and uh, also has uh, an enhanced phase transition. And this goes all through this portal of a Higgs, the singlet that leaves the dark sector and talks to all the particles. So this is one part, sourcing CP violation and phase transition. And then we need something to trans uh, transfer the CP violation from the dark sector to the standard model sector. And these are these set primes that have um, actually, we are gauging lepton or a baryon symmetry, and there's a lot there. It has to do with anomalies, and it's beautiful. Uh, but you are gauging this set prime. This set prime um, can be searched for in many ways. So I will finish here. I'll explain all of that now. It was the part I couldn't make in um, blocking mode. So yeah, I'll look. So electronic, I hope I convince you. Uh, well, first of all, the good thing about electroviberogenesis before anything is that you can test it. And unlike leptogenesis or, or, or gut biogenesis, that you can postulate, but it will be very hard to disprove it. So you could be happy. You will not learn a lot. So uh, I, I hope I convince you that it's an appealing mechanism to explain the matter antimatter asymmetry. Uh, it requires a strong first order electroe phase transition and additional CP violation sources beyond the standard model, I told you, is to keep it, is to generate. Um, I, I, I have said more, but at least I tried to highlight that it may come with interesting new collider signatures and may even accommodate dark matter. I think that's very interesting. I didn't say anything, but um, uh, gravitational wave signatures be an interesting probe of the nature of the phase transition. And, and we are working quite a bit on that direction. Did our first baby steps. Uh, a lot of parameters are important there, like you know, the velocity of the wall, and the actual phase transitions that you have and so on. So there is a lot, a lot of um, room uh, for, for exploration uh, in these models with gravitational racing. And I show you three cases, two that are uh, cases where we are trying to prove that you have an enhanced phase transition. Of course, in these models, you can also go the next step and put the right EP violation and generate the baryon asymmetry. And this light, sorry. Oh, oh we got, okay. And um, this, uh, this idea of, of, of evading uh, CP violation constraints, which are really quite brutal, and uh, uh, that look great. Um, by putting this CP violation in the dark sector and then in the beautiful and exciting model building. So, questions for Marcella? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, can you just say a little more about like what is the calculation you do? If you have a model and you want to know whether the transition is first order or not, what's the calculation you do? Oh. Calculation you do is basically, sorry, that is too much here. <laughs> you basically, you have to do many, oh my God, I'm so sorry. Went, uh, okay. So you basically start from your, that was the idea of this, but of course there is a 
example here. Right? Uh, you, this is my 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 zero temperature uh, tree level potential. That I need to add. Uh, this is a, a simplified expansion, the temperature expansion. The actual uh, thing is much higher. I need to compute this, and to compute this, I basically need to compute, for example, um, th this parameter is related to the fixed mass in some ways. This parameter is related to um, the masses of all the particles that interact with the Higgs. Okay? You have you have to look, for example, yeah. there will be contributions of of, of these guys, uh, of these guys over here, okay? uh, because um, you can you can do the derivative of this piece with respect to this uh, S, and this will give you a mass. This, all of these, this will, this will give you a mass for S when you do the second derivative, this potential, this term, give you a, um, uh, a mass that depends on H square. And this mass that depends on H square is part of this coefficient. All the particles in the, in the background of the Higgs field that you are looking at, because at the end is the Higgs field who is doing the phase transition. Right? But the point is that you add things to the potential to enhance the phase transition. And the things you are doing are actually computing um, these coefficients, this coefficient here and this coefficient here. Uh, of course, here you only you not only have this guy, you also will have contributions because the top quark mass is proportional to h square. You will have a lot of contributions, and so you need to look at your theory fully and compute your uh, in fact, this is, as, as I said, uh, we do it um, not in the high temperature expansion. I just wrote here the high temperature expansion. But in the high temperature expansion, you have T square P's, T P's. There's also logarithmic piece that is important, but I didn't write it here. And, and now these coefficients, this coefficient here will depend on the spectrum. This coefficient here will depend on the spectrum. This coefficient here will depend on the spectrum. So you have to do this. Uh, you know, once you put the whole um, the whole potential, also the common binder, basically have to minimize and, and find you only are looking at critical temperature, find your critical temperature, compute what is the value of B critical over T critical with the whole machinery. Okay. And, and in reality, what you do, you now there are programs like Cosmo Transition or people have other ones. I, I was trying to give a flavor because what we like to do is have a theoretical, you know, an analytical understanding of cosmo transition is a bit of a black box, right? When you have multiple directions, it's very hard. And, and so we have worked pretty hard in trying to have a, an analytical understanding of all the results we have. And I'm quite confident that what we have done is, you know, um, it's in a very good, uh, help us understand in good approximation, the numerical results. Numerical results are, our machine in it themselves. I don't know if that answers your question or. Yeah, I think that understands. Like you, you would say, for example, the mass of the W boson would be non analytic going across uh, its phase transition if it's first order, but it, if it's a crossover, it'll be analytic. Yeah, the, the, the mass of, yeah, the mass of the W will also be part of here, correct? Yeah. And here, but not here, here. So this is what I show. So, so this, is, this term here, uh, so the the uh, temperature expansion and remember you have something that is like this. Of course, this is uh, not gauge invariant in the sense that you are at temperature where the Higgs already has a bed. Uh, so you this gives you a barrier, your potential. Depending on the theory, uh, you could have a barrier at three level or not. Okay. So in reality, I was trying to say I think here, um, uh, what happens? You look. Uh, the vacuum structure, for example, in, in cases you have a barrier, and you have a, a, a difference between the minima. So in this case, you can look at the vacuum structure, and you can get a good answer. Or in some cases where you have a big, um, big barrier, at zero temperature, then um, there is a huge difference between what happens uh, of the vacuum structure at the transition. And, and and to ask the question if the tunneling actually exists. Tunneling temperature is usually a bit lower than the critical temperature. And it has to do with, um, when, I, when I show the bubbles, 
um, basically you have some potential inside the bubble and some potential outside the bubble. Okay? And a T critical when both uh, potential energies, you know, volume energies are the same. When you lower a bit the temperature, then the bubble potential energy uh, goes above the, the surface uh, tension of the of the bubble. They really expand. So, and in some cases, computing just the basic um, critical temperature is enough. In other cases, you need to really go the way through to see nucleation. Yes, please. What are the gravitational wave signals you're talking about? Uh, well, that's the part that we are hopefully going to work much more. So I only have uh, examples, and we are working with Equin on on the last model I I show you to see what it is. But basically, you know, you have this first order phase transition, okay, and that bubble nucleation, this uh, expanding bubbles, uh, produce these stochastic gravitational waves, and there are three types of them. So this is some waves propagating, these are you know, bubble collisions and, and shock, uh, shock waves. And this is turbulence. There are different pieces that I didn't write here, but you know, if you look here, um, it happens that uh, this is not the best situation because um, in the case I show you, uh, there are different type of phase transitions and um, different paths. Different paths, let me say it's simple, is between the orange and the green, so different, step, second step phase transitions. Uh, but when we do higher order corrections, when we put all, didn't talk about basic resumations and so on, it seems that these uh, solutions go well below respect to C. Um, we, we think we can improve these and full disclosure, but you see this is in a frequency of the order of one hertz that, that these things tend to peak. And we think it depends a lot on the uh, bubble wall and it also uh, depends a lot on, uh, on, as I show here, on what type of phase transition are you undergoing. So um, we are at the beginning of exploring this. And uh, I'm not an expert, but I'm learning. <laughs> so, um, and, uh, and we hope to get a much better um, feeling of how much we can probe this first of the phase transition in difference. To learn, we want to learn some patterns. The moment, we don't know that we just do the calculation and we get a result and I can show you the result. But what we are trying to say is, can we learn some patterns? Some type of phase transitions will be more uh, agreeable in a strong first order phase transition. Uh, the velocity of the wall, um, how much that depends on that. So these are parameters that we are trying to um, better quantify. So far we have others who wants to say something. All right, so we have wine and snacks uh, out on the patio. We'd like to hear Marcella again. Yeah.